Hello and welcome to our daily COVID-9 update for the town of Plymouth. I'm Steve Trifletti, your Plymouth town moderator, and we're here each day during June, Monday and Thursday at noon for this update. This is update number 59. It's coming to you live on June 18, 2020 at noon. This <coughs> forum is being brought to you live by PAC-TV on Comcast channels 13 and 15, Verizon channels 43 and 47. You can also watch this on PAC-TV's streaming channel by going to pactv.org slash live. For questions during today's forum, please email us to plymouthinfo at pactv.org. These forums can also be replayed at pactv.org slash Plymouth. Today's participants joining Ken Tavares, Matt Muratori, and me include Dr. Philip Trafletti, Dr. Mark Wilson, Lawrence Pizer, also uh, Stephen Cole, Executive uh, Director for Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation, and Robert Eisenstein. We're going to go right to Kenneth Tavares, Chair of the Select Board for the Town of Plymouth. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I have a couple of announcements uh, to pass on uh, to those watching. The first is, of course, Saturday is election day. The polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The details can be filled in on this program because we're uh, welcoming uh, back our town clerk that has, I think, uh, just one more day of employment with the town before retirement. Uh, wishing you the best, Larry. Also, uh, I have a reminder from the finance director, and this is in her writing. At the request of, of the finance director, please note this friendly reminder to all taxpayers that have chosen to use the select board vote of waiving of penalties and interest as long as the bill is paid by June 29. The town has had a lot of people take advantage of this. However, it is very important to remember that if the bill is not paid by June 29, 2020, the penalty and in interest is substantial as it is applied back to the date it was originally due. We are showing that the following uh, receivables are due to the town at this time, $7,174,539. So again, please pay your tax bills by the 29th to avoid collection fees and interest. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yesterday, uh, I believe many are aware that the settlement agreement between the Commonwealth of, the, of Massachusetts and Holtec Pilgrim uh, was received in, in the community. Uh, the Attorney General's office uh, uh, did well in, in protecting the, uh, the interests of the community and the Commonwealth. Uh, there are still uh, substantial areas that we need to uh, drill down on on both the local level and the national level. On uh, Tuesday at our selectmen's meeting, the Tuesday, the Tuesday coming up, I intend to put a motion forward to establish two core groups to deal with local level. Uh, people that, uh, uh, that are being considered uh, to serve on this committee are being uh, called now, and hopefully the board will establish this by a vote Tuesday evening. Uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, we did uh, a good job. The, the Commonwealth uh, protected uh, many important areas, but there's so much more work to be done. In November of 2018, the board made a list of uh, 15 uh, areas that it had concern. Uh, concerns about. Many of those are still open, and we intend to start tackling this hopefully on a monthly basis uh, beginning in a few weeks. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kenneth Tavares, Chair of the Plymouth Select Board. We're now going to begin our health segment. Uh, each Thursday, we're joined by Dr. Philip Trafletti. He is an attending uh, physician at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, also my brother. Welcome, Phil. Well, good afternoon, Steve, and thanks again for having me on the show. Um, today, I'm going to focus a lot on COVID-19 testing, uh, particularly the nasopharyngeal swab type testing uh, that we use to, you know, find infections. And, you know, along with uh, our other strategies for reducing the spread of infection, like our social distancing greater than six feet, wearing masks, frequent hand washing, you know, I really feel that 
you know, testing is going to be a very important strategy for us going for, uh, forward. So I wanted to give you some examples of ways that we're now doing testing, using testing in some higher risk situations to reduce the risk of spread. So one example would be at our main campus in Boston. This is unlikely, uh, very likely happening also at the BID Plymouth campus. You know, we now are testing all patients who are coming in for different types of procedures or operations. So they, they get tested about two days before their procedure to make sure that they're negative for the virus. So that's that's one 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 way to try to reduce risk of spread in the hospital setting. Um, also at our hospital now, we have a new protocol. If an employee was not wearing their personal protective equipment and had an exposure to a patient, um, you know, within six feet, um, also if it's greater than 15 minutes, that makes it, you know, a high risk exposure. In those cases, we could also test our employees at the hospital for the nasal swab PCR to see if there's any sign of infection of the shedding of the virus. Um, I'm also a medical director at a skilled nursing facility in Chelsea. It's called the Leonard Florence Center uh, for Living. And what they've been doing, uh, it's been recommended in these facilities, as I'm sure you all are aware, this is where we've had our one of our most vulnerable populations and highest rates of infections in Massachusetts and also nationally. And uh, what our facility has now been doing, I, I found out uh, at a meeting yesterday, we have a, a quality meeting once per month. They are actually testing all of the patients and all the staff once per week, which I think is a very high bar um, you know, for surveillance in a very high risk population. But I think it's excellent use of our resources and capacity that we currently have to do testing. So uh, I think that's one example of a high risk population. And I think there will hopefully be, you know, further efforts coming forward, recommendations from the governor, from DPH on other high risk groups that we could do additional testing to try to, you know, keep control of the virus, and especially keeping it away from the vulnerable uh, folks. Then a very interesting article in the Globe this week uh, showed that some companies now are starting to do testing. So there was mention of um, some some of the biotech industry. The Broad Institute at MIT was um, an entry point for a number of the biotech companies would go there and get tested about once a week, and they would use the, that nasal pharyngeal uh, swab, the nasal swab, to do testing regularly. And um, in their laboratories, when the scientists go in and do their work, of course, you know, they're working in close quarters, so they want to try to minimize the risk of spread within the laboratory. So that's why they're doing it. And then there's a, another company called Tango Therapeutics, and what they're doing is having their employees gargle. Um, so they have a different type of test, more like a saliva test. They gargle, and they're being tested a few times a week. And in both of these cases, um, their employees, none of them have... Uh, they haven't found any infections, but if they did find people who had asymptomatic infections, then they'd be able to isolate them and separate them from their other employees to keep their employees safe. So these, these are just a few of the, the uh, ways that we're using testing now. Um, as Matt Muratori has mentioned several times on our broadcast, you know, I did go and look at the MassGov website, and you know, it, it gives very good information. And as has come up on previous broadcasts, if you look at Plymouth, it will show that you can try to get tests through your primary care doctors at Beth Israel Deaconess Plymouth. It also lists the Walmart site. Uh, it lists uh, Atrius has a practice at Cordage Park, but that's restricted just to their own patients. But you can very easily navigate on the site. It will tell you the hours it's open. There's a telephone contact. It tells you whether or not you need a referral, meaning like a doctor's order, or if you can just go directly yourself like you can with Walmart. Uh, so I, I think the website as Mark's been promoting it, as Matt's been promoting it, it's a very good source of information for people if they want to be tested, um, if they feel they need to be tested. One of the other big reasons if people have been in uh, any type of congregate settings like protests, for instance, you know, where they might have been in close proximity to others, um, that might be a high risk situation where you might want to go and get tested even if you feel well. So another example of how testing might, might be helpful. Um, 
you know, I've even thought about in my own office. I've been talking with my own office manager. You know, we do really have the capability. We have the personal protective equipment. We have the swabs. And we're probably going to start testing our own staff perhaps once a week. Again, we work with a lot of high-risk, you know, older patients. You know, many of them have, uh, you know, compromising illnesses, et cetera. So uh, I think this is one further step we can take to try to keep our patients safe when they come in to the office here. And then, um, you know, just to mention again, you know, I think other countries, you've, you've heard probably in the news, us talk before about South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, New Zealand, some of them have had outstanding control, um, you know, by <clears throat> isolating people who get infected, contact tracing anybody who they've been with, and they've kept their numbers very low. And so I think that's really our challenge here in the United States going forward. I did hear uh, on NPR News this morning a great story about they did an analysis of all the states in the United States to see uh, who was best prepared to do this contact tracing, you know, which states have hired enough staff to do this. And it, Massachusetts, I think, was one of seven of the best prepared states in the country. So I feel like we're positioned extremely well uh, going forward in Massachusetts as our numbers continue to decline and show great progress, you know, we should have a great opportunity to keep control of this and try to avoid having a, a second wave or second surge um, in the near future. Um, second thing I want to talk about with blood types, we had a question uh, last week, so I did do a little reading. I found a few things on the internet, um, and basically it's been reported in a there's been a few reports, I think some, some from Europe, Italy, and Spain, also from China, that during their outbreaks, it seemed as if the uh, blood type A was associated with a higher rates of infection and higher death rates compared with blood type O. And actually, you know, I've gotten a few calls myself at my office, patients saying, what is my blood type? You know, people are curious. Um, I think at this point, while it's a very interesting thing, uh, one of the things I read was that the studies so far have not been published in peer-reviewed journals, to the best of my knowledge. So the quality of the evidence, we would say, is is lacking at this point, even though you know it's interesting preliminary evidence. And then even once we do determine whether the blood type is a factor or not, I still think it will probably have you know a limited impact. I think overall on how we would do risk assessments for people, you know, who would be at high risk. I think blood type would probably be. You know, one of the lesser risk factors, um, age is really the predominant risk factor. And I think, you know, this has been going on here in Massachusetts and elsewhere, you know, globally. I think you're going to continue to see that, you know, people over the age of 80, certainly the highest risk. And, uh, you know, we've identified people over 60 to 65, you know, maybe say more moderate risk in that age group. Um, so uh, we'll see how this blood type issue uh, comes up in the future. I'm sure there'll be more research, but we have to be very careful. I think when you get preliminary information in the media, sometimes it's, you know, it's not really thoroughly researched yet. I think this is one of those examples. Um, going to another example of uh, needing to have good studies um, in the area of what types of treatments are in effective. We have seen published this past week another study about hydroxychloroquine, which is also known as Plaquenil an anti-malarial drug that was uh, popularized uh, earlier in the spring and, you know, was found not to be effective for sick patients in the hospital. And now another study has shown that if you were exposed to a person who was infected and then you took the medication to prevent getting infected, uh, what we call prophylaxis, it turns out um, that in the study, if people receive this medicine, hydroxychloroquine, within four days, of exposure to an infected person, it unfortunately did not work. It did not prevent infection. So, uh, unfortunately, another strike against hydroxychloroquine in terms of you know how it might be helpful uh, to us in controlling uh, the pandemic. Um, then the last thing I just wanted to point out, um, you know, again looking at the Mass.gov uh, website, as you know Matt has suggested. You know, there were some interesting statistics there. I thought one of the more interesting ones was looking at how many people are currently in quarantine in the state of Massachusetts with infection. And it's about, it's about right now, 5,000 or so people. So I think that gives you some sense of, 
you know, overall, if you think of all the communities, how many people are actually out there that are infected? And as we've often said, you know, that might be 5,000 that we know about. And, you know, some factor above that, whether it's double or triple or who knows, you know, how many more than 5,000 are probably still infected. And, you know, we, you'd probably love to see that number get really low, maybe in the teens or, you know, blow 100 or something eventually, where you would feel very safe about what's going on in the Massachusetts state. So that's currently where we're at. So um, that's all I have to say for my introductory piece there, and I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you very much. Dr. Philip Trifletti is an attending primary care physician, Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, and the questions are coming in uh, to Plymouth Info at PACTV.org. We've received several. Uh, this is date stamped in the top right-hand corner. So for those of you that are watching live on Thursday, June 18th, please send your questions. And uh, Dr. Phil, it's nice to know that at our age, we're only in the moderate risk uh, category. We're now gonna go to Dr. Mark Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, Dr. Trefletti reminds us that even though we're reopening, uh, not to be confused, that testing and other protocols are still necessary. Welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Steve. Um, yes, indeed, and I'll make a comment about that in a moment. But I thought I would start with um, a report that was recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this past week. Um, this was with, with regard to airborne transmission, um, which is really now recognized as the dominant route for spread of the COVID virus. The journal PNAS is really one of the world's most prestigious scientific journals. And so we really have to pay very close attention to uh, this publication. And basically these researchers evaluated the transmission effectiveness by the airborne route. And what they used were observed trends and local mitigation measures in three settings from the period of late uh, January through early May in Wuhan, China, in Italy, and in New York City. And so the analysis basically demonstrated that airborne transmission, as opposed to other possible modes of transmission, really is the dominant method that spreads infection. And the study also revealed that uh, the trends in new cases from these three epicenters of, of transmission were determined by whether or not face covering was mandated. And they also showed that face covering compliance was the most important factor that shaped the, the pandemic trends, if you will. And so I, I found this uh, not only uh, a very impressive study for um, the, the quality of the information that was being provided, but also the implications for um, our day-to-day -day practices here and really everywhere in the world. Um, they actually estimated that uh, with regard to face covering alone, the re reduced number of new infections was on the order of 78,000 in Italy. Um, this was during a five week period in, in early April through early May. And over 66,000 new cases were mitigated, were prevented in New York City during a three week period that they, they studied. So in the context of other mitigation measures, uh, social distancing and so forth, these, these are really insufficient in and of themselves in protecting the public. Um, and they concluded that wearing a face mask in public corresponds to the most effective means for preventing transmission between people. It's an inexpensive practice uh, and it represents the most uh, important opportunity for us to mitigate COVID-19 uh, transmission. And they also noted, and I will, will share this as well with the viewers, that basically sound scientific science is, is uh, sci scientific research is essential in decision making. And um, this is for the current pandemic, but also for um, health problems uh, in the future. So, and again, this, this was a report that was published in the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, in the context of something that Dr. Uh, Trivaletti's just said, I, I wanted to add a little bit of in the news, if you will, that many of the viewers may have heard about, and that is that Florida, Texas, Arizona, and Oklahoma are among approximately a dozen states that are seeing a surge in cases right now, cases and hospitalizations. 
And so I, I just quickly looked online to see what their mitigation laws are, especially for wearing masks. And I found very briefly that Florida required only uh, mask use of personal care service employees, people who are doing massages or nails or cutting hair and so forth. Texas only recommends, doesn't even require that employees wear face masks. Arizona requires only uh, face masks being used by personal care service employees. And it's, it's recommended but not required for the general public. And Oklahoma has absolutely no state, statewide orders at all. So I think the, to me, the message is really clear here. These are states among others that are on the rise in terms of COVID cases and hospitalizations and deaths. And it's all the more reason why uh, we're fortunate to be living in one of the many wise states where there are dec declining cases, but also um, uh, mitigation measures that people know about and are generally following. And so we're, again, I think fortunate to be in a situation where people are by and large uh, continuing to wear masks. Um, Another article that I'll briefly mention, again, recently published this past week in another highly regarded journal, the Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, and this is with regard to what, again, many people have heard about uh, with regard to asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic infections and how they may be contributing to transmission during the pandemic. Um, but what we don't know are the relative numbers and impacts that um, asymptomatic transmission may, uh, may, may hold for continued transmission. And so this report really reviewed and synthesized the existing public, uh, published, sorry, published scientific evidence um, on transmission. And it's particularly with regard to people who are asymptomatically infected. The studies were drawn from all over the world, from residents in Iceland, from uh, residents in Vaux, Italy, from the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship, from New York City obstetric patients, from the Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier, and so forth. 16 published studies in total, and they synthesized these and summarized them. What they found was, on average, these studies suggest that asymptomatic, no symptoms, asymptomatic patients, oh, sorry, persons who are not patients may account for as much as 40 to 45 percent of new infections. I found this astounding. I mean, we knew it was considerable, but at this, at this uh, magnitude is, I think, quite, uh, quite important to, to recognize. In addition to this, some of the asymptomatics may actually be able to transmit, and I think we talked about this briefly last, uh, last week, that um, asymptomatic and transmitting people are able to infect to others, and maybe even for an extended period of time. And this study, again, reported in its summary that it could be perhaps even up to two weeks uh, that they are asymptomatic, people can be asymptomatically infectious. And so because of the high risk for this silence spread through or from asymptomatic people, it's really important that testing, and again, this is what Dr. Capletti was talking about just a few minutes ago, testing programs uh, continue aggressively, but also to test people without symptoms. Yes, this will increase the cost uh, of, of testing. Yes, this will increase the count of cases, um, even if the White House doesn't want to hear about that. But I think it's really critical that we know that we understand um, the reality. And if this is to be used to inform policies, as it should be, we need to know that reality. Um, we can't put our heads in the sand uh, and pretend that the scientific evidence uh, says otherwise. Uh, we have to recognize these new insights and policies and practices really have to consider the, that scientific evidence and then balance it with social and economic desires. Um, finally, I'd like to add again to Dr. Trifletti's comment about some good news with regard to treatment. And this is uh, something that many of the viewers have probably heard about during the week, which is that a low cost anti-inflammatory drug um, has actually been shown to reduce the risk of death in 
COVID patients, the drug um, dexamethasone uh, is, is an anti-inflammatory uh, that has been used for decades, really, to treat conditions involving arthritis and asthma and so forth. The key feature here, though, is that it is not a, a, a drug aimed to prevent infection. It's not like a, um, an antiviral nor, um, nor a vaccine. And so really what it's able to do is to reduce the severity of uh, severe cases that, that oftentimes will require, especially those with respiratory symptoms, that would require oxygen or even ventilation. So it's, it's a little piece of good news that I wanted to add to the end here um, and to remind people that these efforts to find treatment as well as uh, prevention, pre preventive measures and then ultimately a vaccine are critical. They're continuing. The, the research into this is, is aggressive. But nevertheless, we're still in the midst of, of a pandemic that's uh, not going to go away quickly. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions that might come up during the rest of the program. Dr. Mark Wilson is active professor emeritus, University of Michigan School of Public Health, Department of Epidemiology, and we're grateful uh, for all who participate uh, in these updates. At this time, we welcome back our town clerk, Lawrence Pizer. Uh, Larry, uh, you and I have been together at town meeting for 28 years, and you're winding down. Welcome. Thank you. I'm winding down, but <clears throat> still here for this week. Um, I think uh, the chairman of the select board has uh, uh, reminded you that the time for the election on Saturday is 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, make sure you understand this is the one election that closes an hour earlier than, than the others. Uh, for those people who are planning to vote in person, uh, we ask once again that they bring a mask um, and that they bring their own pen. They should also understand that uh, we are limiting the number of people in the polling place, the number of voters in the polling place, to six. So it might be necessary for people to uh, queue up at six-foot distances outside the polling place in case uh, there are more than those coming. We have sent quite a few, almost 3,000 uh, mail-in ballots um, already for this election, and they're coming back in. Um, this is a time-consuming process as far as get the ballot movement is concerned. So we want people to understand that if they ordered their ballot and have not received it yet, um, you still have two or three days of mail when the ballot could come. Um, if you are voting by mail, it's necessary at this point for you to use the deposit slot at town hall uh, to bring your ballot. You can't bring a mail-in ballot to a polling place. You must bring it to town hall. For those people who ordered a ballot and who didn't get it um, and therefore haven't voted yet, uh, they are eligible to vote in this election by going to the polls. Uh, anyone is uh, eligible to go to the polls, whether you've ordered a ballot or not. The only way that the eligibility would be limited is if you've already voted your uh, mail-in ballot. Um, there's going to be a little bit of difference at the end of the night uh, for those people who are looking for results. Uh, we are not able to admit anyone into town hall other than employees. So the best way of finding out is to call the town clerk's office for results. We will be having people manning the phones, giving the results out as quickly as we get them. The phone number is 508 747 1620 extension 10169. Um, be happy to uh, to start giving results out. Uh, it's just a matter of the uh, there are police policemen bringing the machines back to town hall. We're guessing perhaps uh, by quarter to eight we might have some results and more to follow. Uh, it's a little bit unpredictable. Uh, I would also mention that this will be the uh, first election for acting town clerk 
Pearl Sears. Uh, Pearl will be traveling around Plymouth, uh, bringing ballots to the various polling places. Uh, I will be here at Town Hall, but I'll be here for the purpose of helping Pearl. She will be doing a fine job, I'm sure. And um, I, I want to say finally to all these people watching today, what a pleasure it's been and what an honor it's been for me to have been your town clerk for the past 28 years. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lawrence Pizer, Plymouth Town Clerk. And at this time, we're going to go to Plymouth State Representative Matthew Muratori. Welcome, Matt. Hey, Steve. Thanks so much. Uh, as I said before, um, working with Larry for the last, uh, you know, 15 plus years has been a, a great honor of mine as well. He's always been a very much a professional, um, always ran election, uh, elections, you know, very smoothly, uh, has just done a great job for our community. And um, I actually have a little citation I'd like to present to him now. Um, it's from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the House of Representatives. Uh, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives office its sincerest congratulations to Lawrence Pizer in recognition of 28 years of extraordinary service to the residents and, and the town of Plymouth as an outstanding Plymouth town clerk. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for uh, future good fortune and continued success in all your endeavors. Uh, given this 19th day of June 2020, which will be tomorrow, because you'll get it at your doorstep at home tomorrow, Larry. Uh, and it's signed by uh, Larry. You, Larry was born in Winthrop, so it's also signed by the Speaker of the House, who rep represents Winthrop, uh, Robert A. DeLeo, and yours truly, uh, Matthew Miratori. So uh, thank you and uh, congratulations, Larry, to you and your family. And also, um, also we're going to present you. I don't, I don't know if Julie has it or not, but also we're going to present you with a pin, a state, state house pin, uh, that is actually worn uh, by um, us members of the house, and it's only given out to uh, to folks and uh, who are distinguished. And and Larry, you've been the president of the Commonwealth of Mass uh, uh, Town Clerks Association for a number of years in the past, and. And because of all your work, not just in Plymouth, but within the Commonwealth uh, with town clerks and your extraordinary help in, in, the, um, in the changing of laws um, uh, that on the books since 1972 and a few years ago, you were very instrumental in the changing of some of the laws with how town clerk offices um, operate. Um, I'm going to present you with that pin as well. So congratulations. And thank you. You honor me. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Representative Matthew Muratori, nicely done. Congratulations, uh, Larry, from all of us uh, who have enjoyed working with you uh, throughout these many years. Uh, at this time, we're going to continue with Robert Eisenstein. He's a senior living consultant. Welcome, Bob. Oh, thank you, Steve. Congratulations, Larry. That's terrific. Good, good for you. We are going to miss you. Um, just a, a real quick summary to um, reinforce what both Dr. Wilson and Dr. Tofletti have said. Dr. Um, Jafletti, in particular, your nursing home up in Boston, we're finding the exact same thing. I think what we're what we're seeing now is we're phasing in from really seeing a reduction in in the infection rate to now trying to figure out how to maintain this long term. And you're absolutely right, Dr. Phil, in terms of the weekly testing is the best practice that that we can think of. It is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge on the cost side. It's going to be a challenge on the operation side. But uh, there are going to be recommendations coming out from the CDC has already recommended. It's going to be different depending on the infection rate in each of the homes. But um, let me give you some of the good news in terms of the statistics. And then what I want to do is come back and talk about the very testing uh, systems that are already put into place that I think are making a huge difference. So along the lines of what we're all talking about, you know, when you do more testing, you do fear that there's going to be more positives. But in our case in Massachusetts, we're seeing the trend both the general population and as well as nursing homes, even with the increased testing, there is a decrease in the number of positive cases, fairly significant. So what I do is track the week over week. So for the last week, which ended June 17th, the number of new positive cases was 406. And if you look at that compared to the prior week, which ended 610, there were 741 new positives. So let's call them new, po you know, so there's a decrease in new positive cases being identified across the state in nursing homes, which is tremendous. I mean, I, th I think at this point, we're talking about on average, one or less case per facility. 
um, I've actually started to go out into the nursing homes doing some work on the business side. Uh, actually, Matt and I had visited a facility and we were in a place just to kind of empirically uh, give you a little story that had as many as, I don't know, 20 or 30 infected, uh, infected residents at one point in time. And they're now down to zero COVID in the building. So there's a lot of great work going on. Um, unfortunately, deaths continue, but also deaths week over week, new deaths, if you want to call them that, are declining. So last week, ending June 17th, there was a total of 204 uh, deaths in long-term care facilities. That's down from 224 the prior week, ending June 10th. So again, uh, the numbers are all going in the right direction. Um, just want to talk about, and it's interesting, you can start seeing how this is all sort of coordinating together. The age, for example, average age of death uh, in, in, for, this, for the whole state continues to be around 81, 82 years of age. And so obviously, unfortunately, we're still seeing, and our Matt does this with the aggregate numbers, we're still seeing about 63% of all deaths statewide are occurring, unfortunately, in nursing homes. But again, the average age is 81, 82. Uh, if you go down and look at the average age of the total cases identified uh, based on the DPH uh, dashboard, it ends up being 52. So um, the age of hospitalized, people who are hospitalized, again, not deaths, hospital, general infected cases is 68. So you can see how those numbers sort of correlate with the um, the rate of infection in nursing homes. So moving on to what's happened in the nursing home side, there's been a lot of emphasis on um, what we call COVID assessments. So through the State Department of Public Health and Mass Health, we talked before about this, a very smart strategy is to sort of pay for performance, to tie in your results on the audit, uh, COVID audits to enhance funding. And so what the state is doing is a round of three separate COVID audits for all the nursing homes in the state or those that apply. I think over 90% have applied for it. And you can see the statistics are really working. So in other words, by having these teams coming into the nursing homes and going through all of our policies and procedures on COVID, our PPE compliance, um, everything as far as visitation and really uh, helping the nursing homes uh, comply with the precautions, we're seeing a, a, a real decrease in the infection rates. Just some quick numbers, the uh, facility scores, it's a 28 point test. And the, if you get 28, that's a, um, a perfect score. And there's something that they call in adherence, meaning if you're in adherence, you passed. So the facilities with scores under 20, when they started round one was 13 facilities. And then it went to zero in round two and zero in round three. Um, and the percentage of facilities that are actually in adherence with the COVID compliance uh, audit went from 37% in the first round, and we, we had some problems when we first looked at it, down to 6% right now. Um, so the efforts that we're all making, that we're all talking about, um, are working. I think some of the concern is to keep the emphasis on that. In the nursing homes in particular, we talk about the concern about visitors coming in and out. And you, and you have patients, for example, there was some evidence that showed that some dialysis patients going out to the hospital coming back were at risk before we knew about the infection and may have been the cause of some of the, some of the um, internal spread. So we're being very careful right now, continuing to monitor visitation. We've talked about that. It is gonna be a little bit more of a slow go, but I think the numbers as, as both doctors have said, and I think Matt's gonna repeat again at the aggregate, is really making a huge difference. So uh, we are all with you guys, both doctors, as you suggested, let's see if we can figure out how to maintain testing on as much of a regular basis, whether it's weekly or whatever the, the uh, schedule is. I think that really will help continue the, uh, the low infection and hopefully to zero infection going forward. So uh, again, congratulations, Larry. And uh, let's hope for a good vote on Saturday. And I, uh, I, I yield to uh, the next speaker. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Robert Eisenstein, the senior living consultant. And that next speaker for our business section is uh, Stephen Cole. He's the executive director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Welcome, Steve. Well, thank you, Steve. I'm glad to be back. And I'm uh, also glad you honored the representative's request to, I guess, put him earlier in the lineup. Uh, it's never easy to go ahead of him, frankly. He's always, he's always such a blunt exclamation point at the end of a very vibrant sentence. 
I hope folks at home know he's laughing right now, too. I can see his face. Uh, anyhow, so as the chairman mentioned at the top of the show, uh, some, some news regarding the decommissioning of the Pilgrim site uh, includes some, some stricter standards for site cleanup and site restoration, uh, regular reporting to the AG, funding to some state agencies like Public Health, uh, MEMA, and DEP. Anyone who's ever had to work with those folks certainly are glad that they're on our side. Uh, there's also $30 million in pollution insurance policy that I understand is part of this deal, as well as, frankly, we retain, of course, uh, all local permitting processes to ensure some, uh, some uh, local controls. Um, why I mention this is actually a couple of reasons. Uh, the state DOR reported this week that revenue collection was down by more than half that it was last year in the Commonwealth, um, the same month last year. So to put a hard number on that for folks at home, uh, that, that's about $2.1 billion this month compared to, as I said, this month last year. Um, we're in good company though, frankly, I gotta say, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty wide indicator in the US economy that we're losing 30 to $50 billion a month. And uh, states like Connecticut and, uh, uh, you know, who I keep a focus on because, uh, to say the least, they're, they're, they're a decent competitor for things like tourism. Uh, they're reporting that they're expecting at least $287 million this year in hotel tax revenue to be lost. Uh, that's partly, though, because, I dare say, uh, Connecticut hasn't really been at the forefront of the PR campaign to, uh, to uh, instill in folks some in a sense of confidence to go there. And frankly, I think we see locally too some apprehension when we see Connecticut plates. We've certainly seen no shortage of that stuff on the local highways or on the local um, uh, uh, social media. But frankly, we need to regain those losses. And we can by being better prepared than anywhere else to welcome guests safely. And the things that the Select Board and the Chamber of Commerce have done to open up the streets and public spaces cannot be understated. You know, some towns are doing things that are equivalent to throwing a deck chair off the Queen Mary. Uh, there's, there's almost no real significance to what they're trying to, uh, uh, to what they're doing, to what they're trying to achieve. Uh, and, and despite every new opportunity presented to us, we do need to be vigilant and leaders in exhibiting good behavior. So everything that our health experts are saying to us, frankly, just not gonna, gonna, not gonna get into the rabbit hole of reiterating, but it is certainly in the vein of what we've been talking about for the business and the economic development segments, that you should participate as safely as you are comfortable in the economy. But we do need to be prepared to welcome guests back at some point because tourism is, of course, a very important part of our economy. Whether they come is going to be a statement about whether or not they have confidence that they are going to have a safe and enjoyable time. So I mentioned that um, uh, partly because, um, um, because I think we are in a good place to be able to recover. And what's more, just going back to that full tech uh, agreement for a moment, the reason this land deal is so important is because we need to think about new industries and emerging technologies. Uh, the things we do today will set us up for fast investment. So I, I laud the efforts thus far, and I understand there's certainly more work to be done, but please understand these are things that are going to prepare Plymouth to be able to recover faster than I think most other communities could or will. Uh, there's also some additional assistance for small businesses that I wanna make folks aware of. Uh, the Fed Reserve of Boston, our very own money printers, has announced the, uh, the Main Street Lending Program. Uh, this is a lending program, not like the PPP, so it's not a grant, but it does offer some fairly favorable terms, uh, and it could be a solution for some businesses that are looking, frankly, to grow. Uh, there's no shortage of folks who have said to me that they're looking to expand and hire uh, once they're able to, and uh, there's a good class of folks nationwide of small businesses who are reporting that they're in a good growth trajectory, partly because of new markets, uh, they offer skills, talent, and resources that we have in Massachusetts that don't necessarily exist in some foreign markets. Uh, Mass Office of Foreign Tra in International Trade and Investment exists as part of our in economic development portfolio, as well as, um, as well as MOD, Mass Office of Travel and Tourism. I'm not sure if folk, a lot of folks at home realize that we have this level of government service to attract new investment. I also want to make folks aware of uh, the Mass Small Business Development Center. Uh, they are making some new programming available to folks. This is operated by UMass. They offer resources to small business no matter what stage you're in, from startup to stage two growth, including training in areas like importing and exporting, uh, cash management, cybersecurity, trade compliance and security, things you may not have thought about for your own business before. But frankly, now you have to consider that new markets and new skills are available. So uh, I want to encourage folks to go to msbdc.org, msbdc.org slash training to learn more about what they offer and if they can help. Um, frankly, I want to encourage folks to be bold, take a chance and look into something new and interesting. Your curiosity is powerful and something 
that I think a lot of us need to tap into to keep ourselves fresh and witty and, and alive during this whole period so that we are able to re-engage. Um, and frankly, at this time, I'm reminded of a long dead witticist who once said that you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Stephen Cole. He is the Executive Director of Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Steve, we are going on with Matt Muratori. Uh, welcome, Matt. Hey, Steve, how you doing? So let me, uh, let me just follow up with what both Dr. Wilson and, and Dr. Um, Trifoletti were talking about with regards to the numbers and how good they are doing. Um, as of yesterday, the positive test results with those that are being tested is down to 2.6%. And when you look back at the height of this, which was around April 23rd, April 24th, we were closer to 25% of people that were being tested daily uh, were positive. So made some tremendous strides. Uh, if you look at the seven-day average since mid-April, uh, uh, we've, we're down by 92% for those positive tests. If you look at the uh, three-day average of uh, hospitalizations uh, since mid-April, we're down 71%. And for the first time since mid-April, we are down uh, the hospitals. Those that are in the hospital with COVID-19 is now under 1,000 people in the Commonwealth. We're at 998. Uh, and in the ICU, we're down to uh, 227, and those that are intubated are 130. So those numbers has, have, have dropped dramatically. Yes, we are also, with regard to the deaths in the Commonwealth, um, we are um, at um, 7,734 at this point. Um, with regard to um, the percentages, as, as Bob Einstein said, we're absolutely at 63% of those that um, have passed away from the COVID-19 have been in long-term care facilities. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we are making more and more strides in those areas. Uh, with regard to um, the pop-up tests, test, I know that <laughs> that's my business partner behind me. Don't worry about that, folks. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, regard to the pop-up test uh, sites, um, with regard to those, um, I know uh, Dr. Wilson was, was talking about that, Dr. Trifoletti. Um, I'm not sure if CVS and Carver was mentioned or not, but that is one of the, the sites that is actually um, uh, available for folks, uh, particularly those that have been involved in any protests. Uh, you might want to get over there sooner than later because they're, they're looking to have that done by today. So I uh, just want to make sure that is uh, on the table. Uh, I also wanted to bring up a couple other things. First of all, the census. We haven't talked about the census in a while, but the League of Women Voters uh, is really trying to push to uh, to have us in Plymouth uh, get the census numbers up. And we really haven't moved all that much. They, they have a challenge into uh, seven communities, including Plymouth. Um, and um, we're at right now, we've responded in the town of Plymouth, 65.1% of the uh, respondents have come from Plymouth in regard to the national census. Uh, if you look at Plimpton, they're at 77.5%. Uh, Kingston's at 75%, Duxbury's at 72.7, Carver's 71.9. Pembroke at 70.4 and we're at 65.1. Only Marshfield and Bourne are, are lower than we are. So we really need to do some more work on help publicizing uh, the census and getting people to uh, to get that uh, get that out there. Um, also with regard to the uh, registry of motor vehicles, uh, the real ID um, that was supposed to start this October, I've mentioned this before, Steve, that um, that has been delayed till October of 2021 now. Uh, but if folks that are reapplying for their license, uh, that $25 fee to get the real ID will be waived. Uh, so that was a little bit of good news there. Uh, there's been a, an announcement that came from the governor, uh, the secretary, uh, the secretary, I'm sorry, the Senate president and the uh, Speaker of the House yesterday and Lieutenant Governor that there's going to be some tax relief for small businesses. Uh, the regular sales tax and meals tax and room occupancy tax um, that were due between March and August of this year will not be due until September now. Uh, and if you pay in September, there'll be no penalties or interest uh, for not paying those those other months. So uh, that was some uh, some good relief to, to have. And, um, and that was the that's the update I have for today, Steve. Thank you. That is Plymouth Representative Matthew Muratore. We're going to go right to our question and answer, and uh, we're going to begin with Dr. Philip Trifletti. Uh, Alan writes, uh, given the amount of effort given to developing vaccines for COVID-19, should we expect there will or there won't be regular annual flu vaccines available later this year? And if a regular flu vaccine is available, would receiving that vaccine 
have any effect on our susceptibility to COVID-19 or the, coast, the course of any COVID-19 infection? Well, that's a very complicated question, but I'll try to untangle it for you. Um, you know, I think if you listen to, you know, some of our leading national experts like Dr. Fauci and some of his concern about, you know, when we might have a second wave, and of course he feels we're still in our first wave, um, I think a lot of experts are worried about when flu season hits, we're going to have two viruses, respiratory transmission type viruses, and it may be very hard to distinguish between, you know, whether people have influenza as an infection or they have COVID. Uh, and I suppose there's no reason people couldn't get both, which would not be pleasant, I'm sure. Um, but I do not foresee any problems with uh, influenza vaccination starting in the fall. Usually October is the time of the year with, that we recommend it. Um, it is probably not a big difference if you get it a little bit early. Some pharmacies offer it as early as August. Um, most years we have ample supply uh, of flu vaccine. Um, and, um, you know, typically we get about 50% of the population that will take a flu vaccine. And you know, I wish it was much higher. You know, I, I always encourage my patients, all of my patients, regardless of age, to take a flu vaccine. So. Um, I don't anticipate any problems with the flu vaccine, um, but I, I do think the biggest concern is just sort of the, the coexistence of both infections going on at the same time. Um, you know, as far as the vaccine um, efforts that we have for coronavirus, um, you know, we don't have anything, you know, close enough, obviously, to be available to the community. But, you know, there's a lot of active research going on. I think there's a lot of optimism, you know, because there are about 130, you know, vaccine researchers working on this globally, I think in the United States, about 70. And so uh, I think with the average vaccine success rates, it's about one out of 10. Um, so I think our odds are good that we'll hopefully find a vaccine that's effective for coronavirus. Um, you know, we don't have any other vaccines effective against other, other coronaviruses. So I think that that, you know, it is a bit of a challenge uh, technically to develop this, but, you know, I, there still is a lot of optimism. I know Dr. Fauci is very optimistic about a couple, you know, there's basically five uh, vaccines here in the U.S. that they feel have a very high chance of success. Thank you. And that's Dr. Philip Trifletti, and uh, he is an attending primary care physician at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. Uh, next question goes to Dr. Mark Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson, all this talk about surges of positive cases in the South and the West, how might that translate to the state of Massachusetts? Since we are a society that is so mobile, is it inevitable that we might be affected by these out-of-state surges? Dr. Wilson. Very good question. And the simple answer is yes, I think we will uh, throughout the United States be exchanging infectious people uh, on a regular basis. And so in some ways, it's all the more reason to be mindful of the mitigation measures, practice them even in your local community when you think risk is zero because there are visitors. We're, uh, we're in, uh, Steve Cole mentioned this earlier in the session today that we really want to encourage uh, people to visit, that we want to have a, a vibrant economy that includes tourism. Um, and so this is a reality. I, I think it's important to recognize there's no such thing as zero risk. Um, and, and on top of that, in the fall, as was just mentioned, we'll have multiple uh, sources of symptoms. But in some ways, we would treat the prevention and symptoms uh, in a similar manner for both influenza and for COVID. And so I, I think the key here is to be mindful of who you're with, where you're, where you're spending time, um, and continue to use the uh, practices that we know work well today. Um, the risk will decline with time. It may increase again, um, and it may partly be due to travel, uh, which we know is, is increasing, sometimes from places where there's very high risk. But the risk won't ever be zero. And, and yet, uh, at the same time, we continue to have the right kinds of uh, prevention measures that we need to practice. 
Thank you, Dr. Mark Wilson. We're also going to have uh, Plymouth Representative Matthew Miratori further responding on this question. Uh, Matt. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, thanks, Steve. And I think uh, Dr. Wilson brought this up and Dr. Trifoletti too. Uh, a lot of it's going to have to do with testing as well. And I know the Commonwealth has, uh, has said that by, uh, by July 1st, we're going to be looking at testing at least 30,000 people per day. Uh, and by the end of the year, about by 40, 45,000 people being tested per day. So the testing and the tracing that's been happening here in the Commonwealth since uh, the last six to seven weeks um, is the reason why we're doing all this and why we'll continue to increase uh, testing and tracing for these cases where we do see people coming from, from other parts of the country uh, that you know do have the COVID. Uh, we'll be able to uh, isolate it a lot better by doing that. Thank you. Next question to Lawrence Pizer, town clerk. Uh, Larry, Russell writes, uh, all, and you've already talked a little bit about the polling results, but have provisions been made to advise precinct polling leaders to post election results printouts on the exterior glass overnight after the polls are closed? Larry Pizer. Um, I think we can, we can do that. The requirement is actually for an indoor um, posting, but uh, uh, yes, we can. We can also ask them to put a uh, uh, when they when they are done and closing the building, they can move the posting to the outside. How long it will last under the circumstances, we'll find out. Thank you, Lawrence Pizer, Plymouth Town Clerk. We're now going to circle back uh, to our entire panel for today uh, and ask for a closing statement. We're going to begin with Dr. Philip Trifletti, uh, attending primary care physician. Uh, Dr. Phil, what should we remember today? Well, I don't think I've mentioned this before on the broadcast, but um, I am a native of Plymouth. I was born at Jordan Hospital, and you know I'm very proud of what's going on in the Plymouth community as well as the state of Massachusetts. I, you know, I think when you look at what's going on in the rest of the country with these surges, and I think with, as Dr. Wilson pointed out, um, the willingness of our communities to wear masks and try to do all the other, what we refer to as mitigation reduction strategies, social distancing, um, you know, hand washing. Uh, you know, I think we're doing these things very well in our communities in Massachusetts. And, you know, the numbers are showing it. And, you know, this is really, as I've mentioned many times, it's a marathon. You know, we're still in the first few miles of the marathon from my perspective. So, you know, we're going to have to, to run a very long race uh, you know, to get to the finish line with this uh, pandemic. But I think we're positioned extremely well in the state of Massachusetts. And, you know, as the, the question came in about, you know, how will we, you know, control infection from coming into the state, I think we're going to be positioned as well as anybody in the United States to deal with that. So I, I want to, you know, again, congratulate all of those folks, you know, who are working uh, like Matt in our government to you know, help, set up systems of safety for us and safety nets, uh, you know, with contact tracing, et cetera, you know, so we can keep everybody safe going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti. We're now going to Dr. Mark Wilson. Mark, what would be a takeaway today? Um, I would just like to reinforce this notion that we spoke about earlier that people can be infectious to others and feel perfectly fine. And I think this is really an important reminder that even when you feel that you're okay, you're not going to hurt anyone else. You still should be wearing a mask if you're in close proximity to those people. Um, we, we have now increasing knowledge about uh, the mode of transmission, about the risk factors and so forth. We're still learning a lot more and we need to continue to uh, evolve in our thinking about mitigation as we learn more. Um, but what we do know already is, is a huge uh, increase over what we knew at the very beginning. And, and it's really quite a bit in terms of being able to reduce quite dramatically transmission. We can't reduce it to zero. Uh, we are, as Dr. Trifoletti said, uh, in this for the long run, this is not going to disappear uh, anytime soon. We need to accept that and, and go on with our lives, but in a way that's slightly different and, uh, and demonstrate to each other that we care enough about others to uh, practice the mitigation procedures that we all know well now. Thank you, Dr. Mark Wilson. He is a Plymouth epidemiologist. And we're now going to go back to Lawrence Pizer. Larry, 
Uh, what should we remember? We got a town election coming up this Saturday. We do. We've talked about that. But uh, one of the other things that the town clerk deals with is vital records. And uh, I did a check uh, today on um, death certificates. We, we calculate both the number of people who died in Plymouth and the number of Plymouth people who died elsewhere, uh, the, both of those figures. And for the first almost half of 2020, there are almost 550 deaths in that group. And that's 120 more than a year ago. So I think we all can understand what we've gone through and what we don't want to go through much longer. We need to protect ourselves. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lawrence Pizer, Plymouth Town Clerk. Robert Eisenstein, what's your take on oh, thank, thank you, Steve. I, I think I'm going to stick with a marathon analogy from my doctor friend because I'm actually a marathoner. So when you've hit the 26-mile mark, you still have 385 yards to go. And I can tell you from having run it, you're tired, but you've got to keep going. And the reason I'm pointing out this analogy is I really would like to give a shout-out again to all the heroes uh, Matt texted me while we're here. This is National CNA Week starting June 18th to the 25th. And when I look back, you know, I was in the field myself as a licensed guy. I've been fortunate enough to be working remote. And I just, you know, my heart goes out to these CNAs and nurses and the doctors, you know, Dr. Phil knows from being in the nursing home as a medical director. These are the guys that have been slogging through since March, frankly, for almost four months, uh, doing the work, staying in there, staying in the trenches. And we are finally through the infectious phase. And now the hard work begins. So we get we can't get tired. We got to keep going. We got to get testing for everybody. Uh, and it's a positive sign. But, um, you know, we all have to now support all of our, our heroes who've been doing this for months while we've been, you know, having the luxury of staying working remotely. So that's my message. Thank you very much, Steve. This has been great, by the way. Thank you, Robert Eisenstein, senior living uh, consultant. Uh, Stephen Cole, what do you have for us today? Uh, well, just getting back onto the topic of, uh, you know, how, how we're becoming more transient and moving around again. I mentioned on the last broadcast that AAA and Apple mobility data was showing that uh, folks are driving as much as they were prior to the lockdown. So we're, we're already back into old habits for the most part, at least leisurely. Uh, we're going to see an influx in traffic, no doubt. Uh, be ready for it, folks. Yeah, I think the marathon analogy is a fine one. I think, uh, I think uh, you know, we just got to make sure we stretch, make sure we hydrate, carbo load, right? Um, if anybody has any questions, well, your business, uh, growing it or starting it, relocating into Plymouth, uh, on over the course of the several bro broadcasts I've appeared, I've had the pleasure to actually read some portions of emails that I've received from folks who are interested in relocating into Plymouth from other communities and expressing an interest in, in hiring additional staff. So I think, um, I think we've already done some, some great work. I think the, the folks at the chamber, the folks on the select board, certainly rep moratory, uh, you've done you've done the yeoman's work, making sure folks feel confident that this is the place to come to and invest. But we're not done yet. We still got to make sure we're doing the right things throughout this process, so that we have a fairly facile and appreciable fall. And then we have to get through winter, right? Uh, so, uh, so I look forward to talking to folks as we continue these broadcasts on a, on a needed basis. Um, and just know the foundation is here. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Stephen Cole, Executive Director, Plymouth Regional Economic Development Foundation. Uh, Matt, your closing statement. Well, I'm thankful that we went through a whole show without hearing about Mark Twain from Stephen Cole. So that <laughs> oh, was... you did, you did, Matt. You just didn't pick up on the quote. He was the long dead witticist who said that. Oh, he... okay. Well, excuse <laughs> me for not being uh, so in tune to Mark Twain. <laughs> um, so, uh, without fanfare, yesterday was day 100 of the uh, governor's declaration of the um, declaration of the emergency for the Commonwealth. And uh, we, we have come a long way. It's, it's really has been a marathon. I'll, I'll stick with that theme with folks. I've never done a marathon. I've watched a couple and mm -hmm. it's tiring to do, but, um, but uh, you know, we're, we're getting there. We can't, we can't take our foot off the pedal though. Um, you know, particularly those that are over the age of 65 that un have underlying health conditions, you still should remain home. Uh, try not to get out at all. But all of us that are healthy and able to go out, um, continue wearing the mask. And this is why these numbers are working. Until we have a vaccine, as both Dr. Wilson and Dr. Triple A have been talking about, we, can, we need to continue to do our part. Uh, and the more of us that do our part, uh, the better off we will, uh, we will all be. Uh, the governor plans to make an announcement tomorrow or on or Saturday at the latest. 
uh, for step two of phase two. Uh, and what else will be opening? We're anticipating that uh, the indoor restaurants may be opening as early as, as next week uh, and some other things that may be opening as well. So I would stay tuned to what the governor has to say either tomorrow or on Saturday. Uh, I do want to give a shout out. I have my nuclear power plant hat on today. I do want to give a shout out to Chairman Tavares and, and the board and, uh, and also the Attorney General Mara Healy for uh, yeoman's work that her and her staff did on behalf of uh, the Commonwealth with regard to... Uh, uh, the agreement they made with uh, Holtec to preserve and, and uh, help the uh, Commonwealth be protected over the next several years while decommissioning is going on. And I look forward to working with uh, the board um, and Ken with regard to the next phase of really uh, trying to solidify some more assistance with the town of Plymouth as well. So uh, but I do commend uh, Chairman Tavares and town manager uh, Riggi and others uh, for all the work they've done the last couple of years. And with that said, uh, I'm with Bob. I, I really want to commend all those essential workers out there. Happy CNA week for those certified nursing assistants, all those in healthcare, all those that have, are working and have been working uh, to keep our economic health and our physical health going. Uh, and the best thing you can continue to do at this point is stay informed. Um, as Dr. Trifoletti said, mass.gov forward slash COVID-19 is the best website to get the, the most up-to-date information or even going backtrack to finding out information that's been going on. Uh, is a great way to get information. You can do a mass.gov forward slash reopening if you're a business. So you can see, you know, what, what's open, what's not, what's going to be opening up and what phases, et cetera. Uh, if you have uh, uh, questions about getting tested, that, that's on there as well. Uh, if you have questions, you can call 211. You can get text alerts uh, by texting COVIDMA uh, to 888-777 or in Spanish, COVIDMA ESP to 888-777. If you have questions on health, you can go to uh, bowie.com forward slash mass. And um, as I revised my saying uh, for this show um, the other day, I, I think I want people to remember, let's just keep coming together uh, by working together. And we'll talk to you on Monday, Steve. Thank you, Plymouth Representative Matthew Miratori. And yes, we are staying informed with these updates. Uh, 100 days, and we're going to do number 60 on Monday. I'd like to thank everyone for helping uh, stay informed, uh, Dr. Philip Trifletti, Dr. Mark Wilson, uh, Lawrence Pizer, Robert Eisenstein, Stephen Cole, and we're circling back now to the chair of the Plymouth Select Board, Ken Tavares. Ken, uh, how would you like to close today? Just a couple of brief remarks, and that is to remind everyone that the town of Plymouth is undergoing a makeover right now. You're starting to see tables and chairs where you would never expected to see them in the middle of a sidewalk. Uh, Jersey barriers will be arriving hopefully soon and uh, spaces will be blocked off. We have the opportunity, you know, during these trying times to try new ways to stimulate business in Plymouth. I ask for your patience. I know that uh, there certainly will be high occupancy uh, of our beaches and ponds and recreational spots. Um, we're not going to be able to please everyone. But I think if we're patient with one another and understanding, we're going to learn a lot of new things that are going to be very, very helpful to this community. Um, I always listen on Thursdays to Dr. Wilson and, and Dr. Tripoletti. And uh, I, I look for the, the hints of, the, of we're making progress. I, I feel that way today, but I also understand the warnings of, uh, of washing hands and uh, and wearing masks and keeping the, the distance uh, that is required from all of us. Uh, there's still a lot of work uh, to be done, but as I've said to you many, many times, we're up to the task. And finally, uh, to uh, Mr. Pizer, Mr. Town Clerk, which you will always be to me, uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, job you've done, and I wish you and Ann a great retirement. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kenneth Tavares, uh, chair of the uh, Plymouth Select Board. And yes, uh, these updates are helpful to all of us who are elected uh, in the town of Plymouth to uh, help us make decisions uh, for the town. Uh, this past week, the Select Board did approve uh, my request for a virtual uh, town meeting, which will be held uh, in Plymouth uh, on Monday, August 10. You'll be hearing more about that in the next few weeks. Uh, thanks again uh, to everybody participating today. A and on Monday, we welcome uh, Sarah Cloud, 
uh, Michael Jackman, Heather Cosby, Michelle Brady, Amy Naples, Representative Kathleen Lenatra, and of course Matt and Ken. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Steve Trifletti, Plymouth Town Moderator. Good day. Thank you, everyone.